So we know the circular economy starts with design, but how do you start designing for the circular economy? Is it okay if it's only circular-ish? And am I a designer now? We're going to be answering those questions and a lot more on this episode of The Circular Economy Show. Welcome to the Circular Economy Show by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we develop and promote the idea of a circular economy, engage key actors in that transition, and uh, develop system solutions at scale. My name is Seb. I'm going to be your host for this episode of the Circular Economy Show. And the topic of this episode is circular-ish. We're really trying to drop the curtain, not just talking about polished solutions, but talking about the process and the journey of circular design and we hope to take you with us along the way. Joining me along the way in a moment will be my colleague Joe Isles who in turn is going to be speaking to two innovators who have also uh, been engaged with designing for a circular economy and of course we really do welcome you to join in that conversation, uh, post your questions, post your comments in any of the chat functions across LinkedIn, Facebook, YouTube, wherever you're watching this stream. Welcome, Joe. Joe Isles is the Circular Design Lead here at the Foundation. Joe, I always say about you that you're, you've worked at the Foundation for close to a decade. Um, you're one of the best in terms of understanding the theory, the concept, the idea of a circular economy, but also drilling that down to the practical ideas. What does it actually look like? How do we do it? Um, so why is design so important for a circular economy? Thanks, Seb. Um, that's very kind of you to say. I, I, I've always been fascinated by um, the, the moments where this idea of a circular economy is, is translated into real examples and, and, and the people and the, the, the designers, the creatives who are involved in doing that. And, and, and really, that's why design and the circular economy are so, are so linked. Uh, and design is crucial for the circular economy because everything around us is designed. Um, some of those things, it's really obvious, uh, things like designer clothing or gadgets or um, mobile phones and things like that that are we, we hold up as kind of iconic designs but but also transport systems and and the food we eat and the the, the buildings we live in they're all designed too um, and and so circular design really uh, is an important part of the transition to a circular economy because it says let's take a different approach at that design stage. Let's build in those three principles of a circular economy. Let's think systemically and, and, and nudge us towards uh, a more circular economy rather than today's linear one. Okay, and you're right, that's why we just, you know, those three principles, eliminate waste and pollution, keep products and materials in use, regenerate natural systems. We say they're all underpinned and driven by design. It raises the question, who should apply circular design? Who's involved in this? Well, well you know, you, you don't have to be uh, a designer uh, to, to be involved in, in circular design. I think if we, if we have this expanded view of, of design, that, that everything around us is designed, then we, it follows that, that we kind of have to have an expanded view of who is a designer too, or who designs. And we did a piece of research a, a few years ago off the back of a, a kind of a hunch, really, of saying there's so much stuff around us, all those things I mentioned a few, a few minutes ago and, and innumerable, innumerable more products and services and systems. There must be a vast number of people who influence how those things work. And yes, some of them are designers and designers often have the, the methods, the tools, the mindsets that are really useful in, in navigating um, messy circular economy innovation. Um, but it's many more than that too. It's architects, material scientists. Even if you think about people like uh, in, in advertising who, who influence the, the, the types of services that we choose or the way that we interact with the world around us, then those people who influence whether the, the economy is more linear or more circular as well. And that notion of ev everything is designed is so crucial to understanding the circular economy because we're saying that the economy is also designed and that means also we have the agency to redesign it and rethink it. It's not some naturally occurring phenomena that's happening to us. 
Um, so Joe, uh, at some point last year, I feel like you started talking about this thing called circularish. You sort of forced it into a webinar that we were doing. <laughs> And now that like, you're, you've been bringing, and, and uh, finally we just had to give in and do a circular economy show on circular-ish. What is circular-ish? Why are you so obsessed with it? The reason, Seb, I've become a bit obsessed with this idea of circular-ish, and yeah, I should say it started out as kind of a fun or colloquial way to describe circular design efforts. Because the good news is that the circular economy idea. Uh, is is really mobilized now. More and more people are talking about it and thousands of, of designers and creative people, innovators from either by themselves or in small or large companies, they're all trying stuff out, which, which is amazing. But, but not all circular design efforts are equal. And I think actually we, we sell the concept a bit short if we think that they are. And some efforts are under the banner of a circular economy. They're well-intentioned, but they might just be a bit more kind of uh, an efficiency on today's linear model. Some innovation, let's face it, is kind of in the wrong direction. It may be um, products where materials are, are completely mixed up and are inseparable, um, uh, even though they can, might contain uh, recycled material, for example. Um, we need to ask ourselves whether that's the right sort of innovation for a circular economy. Obviously, um, we're at the stage now where people more more organizations or some organizations are, are seeing circular economy as a, a savvy marketing label. But, and, and thankfully, more and more uh, innovators are trying things out. It's in the right direction, but they're not going to create a circular economy overnight. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's work in progress. And I think that's the point behind circular-ish, that um, no one can create an economy, a circular economy, from a, alone from their garage or from a from an R and D lab, so it, it's a creative process. Um, and with, like with any innovation, um, any um, step forward is also probably going to come with a number of other questions. The bits that the the designer is really proud of, the things that they'd like to do differently next time, the things that were really difficult, um, or, or or what else would have to change in the system to make their their job uh, a bit easier. So. That's really what, what circular, what, what I mean when I chuck out this uh, colloquial term circular-ish, it's about, it's about encouragement, about saying, you've started on this creative journey, um, keep going because there is a bigger idea here. Maybe you did start out looking at materials or making a durable product or, or renting something, but you can always go further and, 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 and push the, the, the ambition of, of, of your, your circular economy innovation. Now, fortunately, the, the, for our audience anyway, um, the exploration of this is not going to be just the two of us. Indeed, you're going to be joined now by Katie and um, Lei Kuhn, who have had a bit of an exploration of this space. I know you have some questions, and we're just going to hand over to you, Joe, to introduce them and, uh, and get into the meat of the session. Sure. Yeah, thanks, Seb. Um, yeah, I'm really delighted uh, today, today to be joined for this conversation um, by Lei Kun Tan, who's the co-founder of Nature Squared. Uh, Nature Squared is a business that focuses on uh, bespoke uh, luxury and sustainable uh, surface design applications. And it, it's built on um, reaffirming the value of artisanal skills by reinforcing the links between nature and human endeavor and the concept of trade, not aid. So uh, a strong materials focus to, to the conversation with uh, Lei Kuhn, which I'm, I'm looking forward to. And also joined by Katie Tregillen, who's a purpose-driven uh, writer and keynote speaker who champions a circular approach uh, to design uh, through a number of different channels, including a great book uh, called Wasted and, and your uh, podcast as well, Katie, which I'm sure we'll touch upon later. Um, but first, I'd love to, to, to speak to you, Lei Kuhn, um, as someone who's uh, maybe a bit closer to the to this creative um, endeavor, this journey um, that, that, that Seb and I were talking about just a moment ago. Do you think you could just start by by telling us a bit about Nature Squared, about maybe one or two of the specific kind of projects or or material innovations that you've that you've uh, overseen over the past twenty years? Oh. Hi, Joe. Seb, thanks so much for having me. Um, what, well, I founded Nature Squared 20 years ago, and we did it then extremely unfashionably by wanting to focus on the bigger sustainability picture. So um, when we looked at the developing economies in which we wanted to make a difference, 
what we found were craft skills. Um, and we found a uh, souvenir making ability. And of course they used indigenous materials, uh, but they weren't valued. And, and for us, that was a real issue because uh, you know, it was, it was about uh, the people, uh, clearly about giving them a platform for, for developing their livelihoods, but also for revaluing the material that was around them because there is this perception that what comes from abroad, from the rich world is, is valuable. And in the rich world, uh, you know, that the, uh, common things are less valuable than rarity. And, and that was the paradigm we really wanted to break. So uh, we looked at what was indigenous, what was fast growing, what was waste clearly, uh, and, and how we could transform them uh, into, into things that would be valued and, and valued, first of all, we're talking about the design world, right? We're talking about value for its, its form and function. It needs to be something that is beautiful. It needs to be something that, that is fit for purpose functionally. So um, uh, Joe, you asked about you know, an example of something we are very proud of. We are very proud, for example, of the work we do with eggshell eggshell, the most ubiquitous material, you know, we are all so used to having our breakfast eggs, chucking away the shells. Um, and of course, eggshell inlay, very laborious, you know, beautiful, uh, has been a, a heritage craft in, in East Asia for, 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 for many, many, you know, for a long time. But that doesn't use an awful lot of eggshell. Um, and so we did two things. We first of all said, you know what? These pretty little birds and butterflies that have a very limited aesthetic, uh, that, that needs to be broken. So let's inlay it all over and you'll get a very different look and feel. It'll use a whole lot more eggshell that we are diverting from landfill. So that was step one. Step two that we're now on is, you know what? Instead of 2000 eggshells a square meter, let's use 20,000 eggshells and let's employ so many more people in the cleaning and the processing of that eggshell. Uh, and so, you know, uh, later this year, we're going to be launching a, 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 a tile product, essentially using crushed eggshells. So um, that I guess in, is one example of, of, of our journey. Uh, and as you say, you know, there are many, many exciting stories out there of people doing similar things. And so, so, I mean, that's a great example, taking, a, like you say, a, a ubiquitous and um, I was going to say low perceived value, but but I mean, mm. certainly very low value. I mean, as you say, most of my eggshells after a, a fried egg go, go into the bin um, and, and turning that into something valuable. If we just look at something like that for a moment, and, and you mentioned this word, word pride, and it's something I'm really interested in when we speak with um, creative practitioners like yourselves. What is it about that that innovation that you are particularly proud of that you think is 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 a real breakthrough? And maybe as a as a side note, is, is what was especially di difficult about it, and that that was that was uh, that took some time to overcome, perhaps? Uh, let me take the questions in reverse <laughs> order because this is something that most people can probably relate to. You think about eggshell, and of course, it's calcium carbonate on the outside. And you think that's great, you know, it's uh, that's easy to work with. But anyone who's ever peeled a hard boiled egg knows that there's a layer of membrane in there, right? And and that's that was the, the technical challenge. How do we deal with it? Because we don't want to eliminate it. That that you know adds a layer of process uh, that is 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 a challenge. So um so the difference between step one and step two for us was how do you, how do you come up with a, a, a system that allows that membrane to be incorporated in the, in the final product? Um, and uh, you talked about pride. Well, uh, we, are, we are very small. We are you know, under 200 artisans uh, in, in the Philippines and pride comes in, in, in two ways. I'm super proud 
of our people and what they have managed to achieve, you know, in the last 20 years that we've been going. But that doesn't matter. What matters is their pride in, in, in their achievements, because uh, when we show them the results of their work, um, you know, we can we can see them sit on the edges of, of, of their seats. This is so far away from the way they live. And the, you, the pride, they, they exude it. Uh, and with that comes self-respect. It comes with different awareness of the environment around them. Uh, what, and they then come up with ideas themselves. You know, they say, oh, can we use this? Can we use that? What about this fruit skin? And you get this virtuous circle, um, you know, whereby you, I loved the word nudge that you used, Joe, because that's what I feel we do. You know, we just nudge people um, to, to, to look at things differently and, and, and you know, to, to follow a slightly more sustainable path, not a perfectly circular one, not a perfectly uh, sustainable one. You know, that's why I, I really buy into the concept of circular-ish. That's good to hear. Um, uh, another another vote for circular ish. Um, Katie, I'm gonna I'm gonna come to you now. Um, and in your book and, and in your podcast, um, the the book Wasted, you feature about thirty different designers, I believe, who, who are working on 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 projects like this. And and is this story is this story quite typical? What what from I mean, you, you've known uh, Le Kuhn for a while now, um, but but what really stands out to you about from stories like this? I think it's interesting that your approach on this particular episode has been to look beyond the quote unquote designer, because it was actually Beth Ann Gray I interviewed for the book who collaborated with Le Kuhn on a collection called Exploring Eden, which was a collection of furniture and home accessories made largely from from food waste. Um, and so Beth Ann, I think, was relatively typical of designers in this space, perhaps slightly atypical in that she's come to this slightly later in her career. So I think her approach to sustainability so far has been to use FSC certified wood to make products that have longevity and will be perhaps passed down through generations. But that's been about the extent of it so far. And one of the things she said to me when I interviewed her for the book was actually this project had opened her eyes to the to the wider sort of possibilities and, and the circular economy in particular. But I think I think where Le Kuhn is is atypical from most of the people I spoke to is actually because of her awareness of the wider systemic implications. So the sort of social implications and the economic implications of working with waste. So all of Lacoon's projects sort of form part of a wider environmental stewardship project and are also helping to sort of support people living on, you know, with vulnerable income. So for example, fishermen, when um, Nature Square buy shells from fishermen, that a gives them additional income which helps to support their livelihoods and b that income is often invested back into things like more environmentally friendly fishing nets and so i think um there's an awful lot of designers who've sort of cottoned onto the idea of working with waste um but i think not all of them have necessarily taken that step further and that's where i again think this idea of circular ish is fascinating because i think they have sort of said i asked a lot of them okay so you're using waste in your product what happens when your product becomes waste? And a lot of them would sort of say, oh, well, it's not going to because I've designed it to last for ages and ages and ages. You know, it's going to be handed down through generations. And my question is always, okay, and then what? What happens in, say, 500 years' time when your beautiful heirloom table is no longer of use? And that was a question not, that not all of them had fully resolved yet. And so I think I think it's important that, you know, we don't shame people for not having got there. I don't think this sort of trend for environmental shaming is, is helpful. I think it's brilliant that people are taking those first steps, but I think it's important to acknowledge that there are more steps to go before we reach a circular economy. Yeah. And we're gonna we're gonna come on to that in a little bit, but let's let's linger on that idea for just a moment then. I think so the conversation that we've had so far has has really um, we've, we've had some glimpses of, the, of, of a bigger idea behind circular design, but we have spoken a bit about, about materials. And it's a place where a lot of designers um, and, and, and creative people and, and innovators in businesses, that's where they're starting. They're looking at what's in front of them, uh, a mountain of, of waste material of some, of some type, and they're saying, that's very tangible. Let's do something with that. And is there a danger that, that you might, in doing that, you might ignore some of the systemic uh, considerations, or, or maybe to put it a different way, just because you can turn waste into something new, should you? 
can that can that lead to some um, some uh, unintended consequences? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer to that is yes and no. I think there are there are there's definitely huge argument in favour of using waste as a raw material. You know, a, a lot of people have sort of said to me in the producing of the podcast. I also write a column for Design Milk called Circular by Design. A lot of people have sort of levelled the criticism. Well, using waste is not circular because in a circular economy there is no waste. And you sort of think, okay, but we're not in a circular economy yet. <laughs> you know, so we've got a sort of the two two hundred year legacy of the linear economy, and there's an awful lot of waste in the environment that if we can scoop up and do something valuable with it, that would be a good thing. So, firstly, I think it's not always a bad thing. Um, I think there is a danger that you sort of legitimize waste and, and create demand for waste streams. So, you know, plastic came about as a byproduct of, of the oil industry um, and now in some ways is driving the extraction of oil. So I think we've got to be we've got to be careful about that. But I mean, there are certainly examples where it's OK to legitimize a waste stream if you're using that waste in a product which can go back into the circular economy so there's a city in in uh, Denmark where 11 companies have, have got together and, and formed 22 waste exchanges um, one of them makes insulin and the byproduct of that is spent yeast and another company turns that spent yeast into biogas and fertilizer so you can see how there are examples where reusing waste stops it from being waste at all and actually a lot of the designers in my book argued that we shouldn't be using this word waste we should be talking about secondary materials or second life materials so I think it can be valuable in that sense um, I think it really depends on the process you know if you're if you're trapping waste products in epoxy resin in a way that they can't be separated afterwards and they can't biodegrade whereas that waste product could have previously biodegraded then that's not a good idea um, whereas if you can use sort of very organic natural waste materials to replace something that's perhaps oil based or chemical based that would off gas in the home, for example, then you're actually using products that are, are safer and, and more natural. So I think I think the answer to your question is it depends, which is so often the case in this stuff. Of course. Um, and, and I think that touches nicely on this idea that. Um, Part of the reason it depends is because we're talking about systems and and they're they're complex and and it and vary from uh for, between different contexts and geographies and cultures and and, and so on and and Lekun, to come back back to you um you've as 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 you, we've said you um a lot of your work or the if we browse the nature squared website you can see the specific materials that you, that you work with but even in our short chat now it's clear that dealing with materials has taught you a lot about the wider system and and what are some of the big the big learnings over the 20 years you've, you've been working with nature squared that that because this isn't just a material story is it there's so much more about the wider um uh the, the wider economic system that that you've discovered through uh through your work yeah absolutely i mean first of all you know people characterize us as, as driven by materials that's the that's the very tangible end of it. The intangible end of it is that we're actually, as as, as Katie so so well described, where our primary driver, insofar as you know, there's sort of one more equal than others, it, are, the, are the social aspects of it, um, and and the economics of uh, of of livelihood. Um, in 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 a, in, a, in a less developed community is is such that it's it's the same it's the same concept to us as as micro banking micro lending you know that if you can augment these low livelihoods by a little bit uh, the, the marginal impact is huge now we don't want to lecture people but but the fact is if that comes with um, uh, an, an educational element, then that has, in systemic terms, you know, clearly does good. At, at the other end of the scale, let's not kid ourselves. You know, um, we talk a lot with designers and architects, and of course, also end consumers. The designers and architects talk talk to their their own you know, their, their project um, owners, and a lot of this is driven by aesthetics and function and that's what these guys are paying for okay and if we come and we say look this thing 
is is not particularly beautiful, but it, it is very virtuous. Please buy the virtue. It isn't going to fly. So so therefore, the 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 economic model must be one in which you deliver something that is desirable at the and at the best, at the most optimized sustainability price that you can. Um, and, and the example that, that I, I often give is, look, you know, we do what we do and we try and make it as, as circular as we can. But then an architect comes along and says, I need to put this in a public space or I need to put this on a cruise ship. It needs to meet this flammability standard or it needs to be a floor that's walked on. And in one stroke, you have put a coating, an additive, a something that, that, as Katie says, you know, negates an awful lot of it. But this is the real world we live in. Um, and I'd rather have that opportunity, have that conversation and, and, and carry on on that path than lecture them and say, no, what a terrible thing to do. You know, how could you possibly want this? I think that's a that's a great sentiment um, and, and one that, um, that that really resonates this idea that, that you spoke about it as a path and, and, and an implied journey. And I think um, there is this sense of um, keep starting, but keeping going. And, and Katie, I don't know if they, there's if it, you speak to designers and either glean from them or, or maybe with your experience, you, you, you give them a steer. But but is there anything you could share about how to how to celebrate those those early wins and successes, but to to keep going because um, it it is a, a journey and potentially quite a long one if we're really thinking about this um, very ambitious future circular economy. I mean, I think I think transparency is the most important thing. So there is so much greenwashing out there these days. I think it's often quite difficult for consumers and even interior designers and architects who are specifying products to sort of tell the difference. And I think the brands who I think are, are doing best and the sort of even young designer makers who are doing best are those who are being really honest. So sort of saying, this is where we're trying to get to. At the moment, we're here. You know, we've we've achieved steps one and two. We're halfway through step three, but you know, it's a 10 step plan to where to get to where we want to. Um, I think there are also sort of certifications like the sort of B Corps standard and soil association. And, you know, there's unfortunately far too many of them. Um, but I think some of those sort of uh, situations where you're not marking your own homework can be quite helpful. Um, EPD labeling, so environmental product declarations, I think that stands for. Um, I think some of those things can be really helpful to sort of combat some of that greenwashing and, and have that transparency to sort of say, these are the bits we've achieved. But I think some of those sort of big certifications are not open to smaller, smaller companies. Mm. So I think I think for brands just starting out, it's about just being really honest and transparent about the steps that they've taken and the steps they're yet to take. Um, and I think being honest with themselves about that as well, because I think sometimes it's that sense of sort of, well, you know, I've done this thing, tick, I can I can rest on my laurels now. And I think understanding that it is a journey, it's not you know, there is no product that is perfect in terms of, of sustainability. There are always compromises to make. And, and I can give you a very personal example, which is that when I started writing the book, I said to the publisher, it cannot be wrapped in plastic and it must be made of waste. You know, and I wanted those things written into my contract before we started. And she sort of said, look, I can't write them into your contract, but I promise we'll do our absolute best. So um, at one point in the process, she came back and said, look, we've investigated the potato starch um, poly wrap it doesn't last long enough. It starts biodegrading after six months and the books might be in storage for a year. So we're going to wrap it in plastic. And I was just like, no, we can't do that. You know, we have to try harder. And in the end, we found a poly wrap that's actually made from a byproduct of the sugar processing industry. So it's a sucrose. It looks and feels and works exactly like a plastic poly wrap. Um, so that was a win. And the publishers actually now using that for all of their books, which is fantastic. Mm. Paper, on the other hand, the cover is made from a uh, waste product of the leather processing industry. So the cover's made from waste. The paper I really wanted to be made from recycled paper. But the cost implication of that meant printing the book in China and then shipping it largely back to Europe and America, which is where the biggest audiences for it were. 
or making it so expensive that most people wouldn't have been able to afford to buy it. Um, and so actually, we decided the carbon footprint of all that shipping negated the benefit of printing it on recycled paper. And so it's printed on FSC certified virgin paper, which sort of feels really wrong for a book about waste. But actually, when you took into account all the, the complexities, that was the most environmentally sound mm. decision. And so I only share that example to sort of say that I think there are compromises always. And I think the more open and transparent we can be about those not only to sort of prevent greenwashing and promote transparency, but also to sort of encourage our, our competitors, our collaborators, the other people in the industry to sort of say, you know, this is not about me pretending I've got this perfect. It's about sharing my journey so other people can, can perhaps learn from that. And, and, and learn from it and, 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 and maybe go further, hopefully mm. go further and, and build on it. I know Seb's been listening in intently, but I just have one more question uh, that I would love to get a, uh, a quick answer from both from both of you. Uh, we have spoken a lot about about materials. I think it is something that designers deal with or are very uh, in close proximity with on a day to day basis. So in a sense, that's that's unsurprising. But we've also in this conversation knocked on the door of some of the much bigger ideas around um, people's livelihoods and uh, and uh, the social benefits of of um, creating pro uh, products in this way. I'd just like to get a sense. Lekun, starting with you, what would it be like if, if the whole economy worked in this way? Um, can, you, can you maybe s s highlight what some of the benefits would be if, if it wasn't just Nature Squared and, and a few other pioneers, but, but the whole economy worked like this? Oh, wow. Um, dare to dream is your question, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> first, first of all, may I say, you know, we're... we're we're on a very modest journey. I, I don't pretend to, to give anybody lessons in, you know, how this should, should all work. But if I were to extrapolate from our value system and our approach, then I, I guess my headline that it would be that people would think through the complexities, make those, weigh up those choices that, 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 Katie, you know, so so um, graphically uh, illustrated, and come up with the sensible answer for that set of circumstances. And I'm sorry to be as vague as that, but the fact is that ducking the complexity is is where the problem often is. You know, we want the sound bite, and even if the intent is not to greenwash. Um, you know, we've been watching resins develop for the last 20 years. Our material scientists are, you know, and, and chemists have been watching this, uh, innovating on our own. And the fact is it's not there yet, but go look at how many, how many brands say we use bioresin, you know, our, our chemicals are, are responsibly this and that. And, as, as Katie says, I think it's very important not to kid ourselves. And if everybody were open-minded to balance those factors and to make a sensible choice, and sensible includes money, no question, then I think we might get a little bit further on that journey. And what about you, Katie? Just uh, a quick, quick but massive answer, I guess, on that question. <laughs> It's quite interesting because I recently came across some research from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology that kind of answers this question. So they looked into what would happen uh, if the whole world adopted a circular economy, what would happen to, to the economy, to jobs, to sort of people's economic prosperity on an individual level. And then they looked at what would happen if just Norway adopted a, a circular economy. And I, I think for Norway, you could probably substitute developed nations. And um, what they found was that if the whole world developed a circular economy, there would be a growth of 2.5% new jobs. And that would be particularly in developing nations, particularly for people with low to medium education and particularly women, the people who are most impacted by climate change. So, I mean, that's a, a brilliant outcome. However, they also found that if only Norway were to adopt a circular economy, those same people, so people in developing nations, people with low to medium educations and women would lose jobs. 
And that's, as you can imagine, if everybody in developing nations are repairing clothes, for example, there's going to be less demand for, for cheap clothes from, from countries like Bangladesh. And I think what that says is that we have to do this in a really inclusive way. It's no good certain countries rushing ahead on this and, and leaving others behind. And there's actually a, a beautiful quote, which I'm, I might leave you with from a book called All We Can Save, which is an anthology of women writing on the environment. Um, and it was edited by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson and Catherine Wilkinson. And there's a, a lovely quote in the introduction when they say, to change everything, we need everyone. And I think that just sort of sums up, you know, the way we need to approach a global circular economy. Thank you so much, Katie and Lekun, for, your, for all your uh, great insights there. In circular design, we encourage zooming in and zooming out to, 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 to problem solve effectively. And I think we've done a lot of that today, um, zooming into some specific innovations uh, and zooming out to, to this bigger idea of, of a circular economy. So I appreciate that. Seb, I know you've been on the edge of your seat uh, listening in there. Um, what, what were some of your reflections? You, you've been zooming in and out so much, Joe, I'm actually feeling quite dizzy. Um, <laughs> but uh, actually, I didn't prep um, our guests for this, but there have been a, a couple of interesting contributions online. I just want to just throw them out there for some really quick responses, um, because obviously this conversation, to some extent, we've done a bit of sort of encouragement, like have a go, do something, design something, and then a little bit of like, well, there's also these big system-wide implications to think about that might make your exciting design somewhat null and void even. Um, and I suppose just picking up on, a, summing up a few of the comments that have come in, and maybe for you, Katie, to tackle in the first instance, um, can you give us a bit of hope? Like what's the, what, you know, people should still go and dive into this, right? And give it a go for lots of good reasons. Yeah, lots of good reasons. And I think actually there's something really important about embarking on that journey because that's how you start to learn that's how you start to understand the biggest bigger systemic implications and I think you know there's a danger that we can just sort of get overwhelmed by this you know there's a reason they call it a wicked problem it's so complicated and so interrelated I think the the worst outcome is we can sort of say oh it's all it's all too complicated I can't you know whereas I would really encourage designers, makers, craftspeople, anybody sort of working even in the broadest creative industries to, to start. And I think that's how, that's how you learn. And your first project might turn out not to be the one that's going to, to make a difference, but you'll learn so much from that first project to invest into a, a second project. And I think the second thing I'd say is none of us are going to solve this problem on our own. This problem is going to be solved by lots and lots and lots of people all chipping away at their little bit of the problem. So I think if, you know, if your problem is not going to save the world on its own, that's okay. <laughs> Thanks, Katie. And a good, and finally, a good provocative question from uh, Margie on, on LinkedIn. Um, they ask, they're asking a question about what makes a product circular. And their question is, is if a product is made with good materials designed for disassembly, but there's no take back system, there's no system around it to collect it, is it actually circular? I don't know if you want to take that one on, Joe, and whoever wants to jump in on that one. Well, I mean, I'll throw that over to, to Le Kuhn, maybe, who um, uh, is, is a bit closer to the to the creative process than, than I am. I mean, of course, the, you know, the theoretically correct answer is that it's not. I mean, circular is circular, definitionally. Um, but again, you know, uh, back to, to, to Joe's concept of circular-ish, um, if, if there is no take back, it's not. But if you stop uh, a, a linear, something that's going to be wholly linear at some point, and you give it a little, a, a little bit of a U-bend, you're already doing something better. Now, I, I think that your, um, your, your contributor, Seb, um, you know, is, is quite correct in, in the premise that it's not wholly circular, of course. Um, but going to Katie's point about if I'm making something of such good quality that it lives 500 years, well, I will take the 500 years over 500 days any time, any time. Because, you know, in, in 500 years, we may well have different solutions to these things. Well, guess what? In 500 days, we won't. Thank you. And Katie, thank you so much for joining us on the Circle Comedy Show. Joe, your firstly, Circular-ish is taking off. You've definitely got two advocates for it here. Secondly, I'm not... trademarked it, Seb. <laughs> We're not quite done with you yet, Joe. We've got one little... Uh, we'll just wrap up with you in a moment. But before we do that, 
just a reminder to our viewers that this is just one episode of the Circle Me Economy show under the foundation's wider content and focus on circular design. Let's take a quick look at some of the other conversations we've hosted previously, which you can find on our YouTube channel. But it does strike you as such a strange phenomena that we can produce a material that I know keeps a salad fresh for two hours, three hours until it's bought at lunchtime and it's good for 500 years. And that to me you know, just crazy, seems yeah. just, it's a design flaw. And it mm -hmm. always struck me. So what are you asking the designer to design when they design that piece of plastic? Because it's amazing science. It can you know, keep it fresh and let bits of it breathe and all of those things. But actually, is it designed to last forever or is it designed to do that for a certain period of time? And, and that design question is something that we so often come back to at the foundation. It's what are you actually asking people to design? I can't keep on making more products uh, that goes into the world that will not be taken care of or will not, uh, nobody would take responsible for. I always find it quite an amazing paradox, both that there's so much plastic in food, which as you say, is um, this weird combination of like the most short lived objects i.e. food, yeah. um, with the most long-lived objects, i.e. plastic. And also that you get so much plastic in um, kind of kids' toys and diapers and wet wipes. Mm. Again, it's like, it seems so paradoxical that you're yeah. you're buying these materials that are going to have a kind of long-lasting negative effect on the planet mm. to use for your children that are going to be the ones that inherit the planet. I think creative industries bring the notion of impossible as solvable. It's an impossible, complex, intractable, big issue. And, and what the creative industries will bring, first and foremost, is a mindset, which is impossible as solvable. Everything was impossible once. I mean, it was, uh, pretty much everything was impossible until it got solved. So in that video, we heard from, among others, Lily Cole and IKEA, various conversations the foundation has hosted over a period of time with leading designers and leading design thinkers, all available on our YouTube channel and cropping up consistently uh, in episodes of this show and the foundation's other activities. Um, Joe, we're back. Great. Um, just a couple of final reflections on the conversation we've had today and also looking at that video that the circular design seems like it's something that's extremely is extremely varied as an idea. Is that true? I think that is true. And, you know, this is circular economy in this kind of recent wave of activity of momentum is, is really, um, uh, the term has really grown in the past 10 years, which is a relatively short time, time scale, really. And really, and circular design as a, as a discipline that people can kind of organize around and start to experiment with even shorter than that, really. So um, it, it is, um, it, it's emerging. But I think what, what you had ex some examples of uh, in today's conversation and in the video you shared, Seb, is that yes, circular design is about um, materials, about products, about um, making um, isolated or, 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 or um, coupled innovations um, more uh, um, feasible, design for disassembly, the durability, um, smarter materials choices and things like that. Um, but it's also about um, business model innovation, about a whole, or, uh, maybe a whole organization. I mean, you heard from Ikea there, they're rethinking um, all of their 10,000 different products in their catalog along a circular economy roadmap. So different types of solutions and, and starting to rethink the value that they provide to their customers, not just through one or two isolated innovations, but through thousands of different innovations. And then you've got even bigger, even a bit more kind of abstract is, how we design for systems change. You mentioned um, that the economy is designed, Seb. I mean, we, we can argue about that um, uh, uh, next time we're, we're together in the office, but, but really, is it designed or is it the, con the, the consequence of innumerable different design decisions that, that are combined and, and kind of ladder up to this to create a system? And, and I think, however you look at it, those different design decisions can nudge and we use this word nudge but can can shift the economy towards um a, a more a more circular outcome um i definitely won't be taking you on and on <laughs> you on any debates joe one final question from me is obviously we talked about this a bit earlier that when we say that everything is designed i know we've heard tim brown from ideo former ceo of ideo say 
everyone is a designer. We've talked about this before. It can feel a little bit almost scary to even for people like yourself and I to think about ourselves as designers. Is your message to our viewership here that we need to get more comfortable with thinking of ourselves, at least in having design roles in the economy? Yeah, I think so. I mean, um, I think if you if you acknowledge, like we said at the start of the session, that um, everything is designed, then there are many more people who can influence the way that things work than that those that just went to design school or have design in their job title. As we said, those people do have uh, a, a, a toolkit of, of methods and ways of working which are really helpful, but there are many more people who have agency and, and, and the enthusiasm to um, reimagine the world around us along, along circular economy lines. So yeah, we are all designers in, in, in some respects. I also think you, you kind of, you have to do it um, just because I, I made a loaf of bread. It doesn't mean I am a baker, although I kind of am an amateur one. So you, you have to try these things. I don't think we can all say that we're, we're, we're designers if we're not trying to uh, reorient or, 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 or change a bit of the world around us. So I think you can be a designer too, Seb, but you have to, you have to do it. I hope I'm a better designer than you are a baker. Um, <laughs> Joe, thank you so much for joining this episode of The Circle Me Show. Um, and thank you to uh, you at home or in your offices, wherever you are watching uh, this session and whether you're watching it live or whether you're watching it in catch up and for those questions and comments that you've been submitting throughout. So we've heard that the circle economy starts fundamentally by designing things differently, underpinning those three core principles. It's a much bigger idea going beyond uh, recycling to how we design uh, the design decisions that make up how our economy fundamentally works. And you have a role in that. Um, and hopefully what you've heard in this session is that you can embrace the journey and the process of doing that rather than feeling that you have to be submitting these polished solutions. That's all for this episode of the Circle Economy Show. We'll be back in the same time and place in two weeks' time. But we're also live on Instagram. The Foundation is live on Instagram tomorrow at the same time uh, at 3 p.m. Um, and we'll be talking uh, to Organic Basics about their design decisions and how they're involved in our jeans redesign product. So do make sure you follow the Foundation on Instagram and join that conversation. It will be hosted by the Foundation's Francois Suchet. Subscribe to all of our channels, like and share this video, do all those nice things. Otherwise, we'll see you next time on the Circle Economy Show.